This episode of Elwood City Limits is brought to you by the fine products at Microsoft. Whether it's Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, or any of our wonderful suite, you can trust in the value and in the dependability of Microsoft. It's true. It's true. Um, right now, me and Will are, of course, uh, talking on S- Skype, a fine uh, Microsoft product. Um, mm-hmm. And I can assure you that all of my web, uh, um, well, first of all, the web browser I'm using is, of course, Microsoft Edge, my favorite web browser. Um, and so I'm, I'm not aware at, of any other browser. No, 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 no. I, 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 it's funny. They should just call it Microsoft Edge because there's no other way to surf the World Wide Web. And, of Mm -hmm. course, the Arthur episodes we've watched today, I've uh, purchased from the Xbox Live store uh, from the the video portion. Um, So that's how I've watched Arthur today. Um, And I think soon after, you know, it's E3 uh, coming up soon, Will. I I just can't wait for the Microsoft uh, Microsoft showcase uh, to see what further exciting products Microsoft is going to be giving us in the near future. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, in case in case you missed it on the last episode of Elwood City Limits, uh, this is your sign that both Lucas and I have gotten our first COVID vaccination. That's right. <laughs> That's right. The brainwashing has taken hold. Um, I, I love uh, spreadsheets. I love Excel. Um, and I also love, um, you know, getting one step closer to being safe from the novel coronavirus. Mm-hmm, that's right. And uh, we're not actually sponsored by Microsoft, <laughs> unless. Uh, but really, welcome to Elwood City Limits, the episodic Arthur podcast. Uh, Will Young here with Lucas Mancini. The uh, yeah, number one podcast on Zoom. Absolutely. <laughs> the, the one podcast on Zoom. <laughs> Uh, we are really excited to be, as Lucas said, uh, our first vaccination for the coronavirus is behind us, and it'll be a couple more months until we can get our second, probably not as long as was originally given to us, but uh, yeah, things are looking up, and hopefully within the next couple of weeks, uh, the province will be starting to open up again soon so we can uh, see other people. I'm tired of being trapped in my boiling apartment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, true. It's, it's the throngs of summer now. I have... Uh, apologies if um, any of the audio picks up my open window. It was a, a choice between that and having the fan on, which would make for an even worse recording. So that's the kind of weather we've been dealing with lately. Uh, uh, summer has sprung. Um, and so, yeah, it'd be nice to get out and enjoy some of it. Um, I appreciate your unselfish nature. I have both the window open <laughs> and the fan on right now. So <laughs> thankfully it's not making a great deal of noise. Um, yeah, we're, it's, uh, very much, very, very hot over here. And hopefully if you're beating the heat or waiting for the heat to start, no matter where you are, thanks a lot for joining us. We always like to start an episode of Elwood City Limits with, uh, going over to the emails, elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. We have a couple of correspondences this week. This first one is from Neil, who's currently going through the backlog of episodes at an alarming rate, Neil says. Arthur's been a comforting show to lean back on during the last year and change. It's a show my sisters and I still watch when we get together. Was also very excited to see that you guys are fellow Canucks. I was in Halifax a few years ago, and I get excited any time you guys mention a place that I had been to on my visit. My favorite spots when I was there were Kitsune Sushi Bar and Two If By Sea. That's funny, Two If By Sea. That was very close to my my old apartment back when I lived on the, the Dartmouth side of the harbor. Well, well, Neil, you might have just miss a, missed a neighborhood Lucas Mancini sighting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that would be that would be something you would definitely remember for the for the rest of your life. Uh, in one of your earlier episodes, you ask about if there are any towns that do a fruit centric festival. As someone that lives in Leamington, Ontario, for a few years, I must tell you of the yearly tomato festival. Leamington is the tomato capital of Ontario, and Heinz used to have their factory there. The downtown help desk was even in a tomato shaped kiosk. So there you go, uh, uh, Leamington, Ontario's tomato festival. I feel like not the only tomato festival. Um, isn't there like a tomato festival in Europe or something where they like throw tomatoes at each other or something? Yes, yes. They, everybody has a big tomato fight. I can't remember if that is. I should really know this if it's Spain or Italy, but I think it's in. Yeah. Uh, something's telling me it's Spain, but it, it could be Italy. Um, but yeah, there's like a big famous tomato fight. I uh, I got to get to that information desk that's shaped like a tomato. I love a, a giant uh, fruit or vegetable like the Oxford blueberry out here. 
Uh, I also wanted to voice my dismay at you guys not mentioning that in Prunella Sees the Light, her friend Marina is shown to be a soccer player on a Mighty Mountain soccer team. That was huge for me. Totally, totally missed that. But that's uh, the first uh, the first Olive Branch extended from uh, Elwood from uh, Lakewood Elementary to Mighty Mountain. Their perpetual enemy. It's true. We haven't seen much, I guess, except for that one example that totally went over our heads. We haven't seen much characterization of the Mighty Mountain kids. It's really been like a distilled, one-dimensional, cartoony, kind of 80s style. The Mighty Mountain kids are just evil. They're just enemies to be vanquished by the uh, the Elwood City squad. So uh, I, I wish I had noticed that detail before. Yeah, me too. And our other email comes from Eddie, who kind of wants to take back what he said about the Arthur Dark Ages. Maybe Dark Ages is a little too harsh, and to be honest, I've never watched Arthur past season 18. I'm excited to go through the modern seasons with you guys. I'm catching up to new episodes of the podcast pretty fast. I'm on episode 106 now. Once we get to season 13 through 15, we'll be getting into the era of Arthur that I grew up watching. Some notable episodes are Through the Looking Glasses, Pride of Lakewood, Sense Less, and To Eat or Not to Eat. The Rabbit Dog Big Boss Bar is another cartoon food that I always wanted to try, which is something that is uh, in an upcoming episode of Arthur that we will take a look at. I want to say uh, next season. The Big Boss Bar. I, I mean, this is kind of spoiling a joke I should probably say for when we watch that episode. But what is it? The the Ball family? The Lamello Ball is, is making the Big Boss Bar? Is it a Big Baller brand Big Boss Bar? We'll it's just me. It, no, no, it's just me saluting at the grave of the chocolate bar and just going. There can only be one <laughs> big boss bar. <laughs> um, actually, with this episode, I believe it is. I'm just doing some uh, some ad hoc on the spot uh, research here because we're often asked, uh, you know, how many episodes Arthur is. Like, where are we at with this? This is technically the episode we're doing right now is episode 149, which means. That as it stands right now, we have 100 episodes of Arthur left. Wow, the uh, there final may, of countdown. Course, there may, of course, be more to come, but yeah, 100 episodes. Now, that may sound like not a lot, but not to worry. With the new schedule that we're on with this and for the kids of PBS Kids podcast, that's going to add up to <laughs> several more years before we even sniff the end. So that's kind of your update here uh, with as to where we are with Arthur, if you want to look at it that way. Thank you very much for your emails, uh, Eddie and Neil. If you would like to be like them and get your email run on the air, elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. I also want to give a shout-out to a little Instagram uh, uh, messaging that I had today. Uh, Yuri Underwood, or Uri Underwood, excuse me. Uh, thank you for discovering the podcast, and whenever it is you listen to this episode, hello, nice to meet you, and hello to Caitlin Ward as well. We have some wonderful messages all across our social media, and we appreciate you doing that, so please hit us up whenever you like. Um, we also want to give a shout-out to our patrons. Patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits is where we have... Well, the other week of programming that I kind of alluded to, we've been continuing to do for the kids a PBS Kids podcast, and our most recent episode is part two of six of our exploration of the PBS Kids bookworm bunch, and that was, why am I blanking on it? We just did it, Lucas. Elliot Moose. The, Elliot Moose. My word, thank Will. You. I, hey, dear listener, maybe that is indicative of Will's thoughts of Elliot Moose that he forgot it so quickly. You'll have to listen to the episode to find out. If you're not sure about, uh, you know, if you'd like a, a show about us talking about PBS Kids shows, we always put a free preview of it the week it comes out onto the free feed so you can check it out for yourself. And I will remind you that the Patreon is pay what you can, pay what you want. And it starts at a dollar and goes up from there. We have some lovely 65 patrons, uh, which is more than I certainly ever thought that we would have. And we are grateful for each and every one of you, including people like JHC. Kevizard Edits, Daniel Uptograph, uh, Lee Goldson, Yoshi, Melissa Avales, uh, Andrew Power, Michaela Gibson, Sierra S., Kat, William, Kevin Noon, and I'm going to go to page two for this one, Macy Ball, Stella, Joe Sue, Emily K., John Griswold, 
and Leanne S., our very first patron. Thanks, everybody. Again, that's patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. We appreciate the support, and uh, thank you to those couple of listeners who have donated over at my uh, personal Kofi in the past month or two. That has been very appreciated and is always a nice little thing. But, of course, you don't have to pay a cent to that's listen true. to the prime episodes of Elwood City Limits, which is what we are here to do. We're talking about... Well, first of all, the story is called For the Birds. And Lucas, I know you're excited about this one. It's a brain episode. That's right. Well, I actually, uh, I know you're being, um, you know, a little bit facetious here. But I actually yeah. am excited about this episode. And I, I, I can't remember if we've talked about this on the pod or not. But one of my uh, reoccurring daydreams or something I've just been adopting lately is that I've been talking about how I, I want to adopt bird watching in my old age. Like I, I, really? I I'm always obsessed with kind of what kind of guy I'm going to be, you know, I'm always can, talking about like, hmm. Oh, I'm going to be this kind of guy. I'm this kind of guy. Like right now, I don't know if you saw my Twitter today. Uh, it's, it's ska summer. I'm officially declaring <laughs> it's ska summer. Ska summer starts now. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. It's ska summer. And so all summer long, I think I'm going to be a ska guy. But, you know, nothing lasts forever, um, and you always have to be future-focused, looking towards the future. And so I was thinking to myself, you know, how am I going to fill my days when I'm retired? Uh, I can't just play Call of Duty Warzone all day long. First of all, the, they're not going to even be patching the PS4 by then. So I got hmm. to thinking, what is something that never gets patched? What is something that never, you know, needs to be updated uh, and that's the great outdoors, Will. I think I'm going to become a birder, a bird guy. I think that's what I'm looking forward to uh, in my old age. It's like a real-life Pokedex. Um, so that's something I've, I've kind of uh, daydreamed enough to to say out loud, but not put any further effort into beyond that. I don't have binoculars. I haven't even looked up like what you're supposed to do. Uh, I haven't really researched beyond that. That's That's a problem for 20 years from now. But that's why I was kind of excited when I learned this was an episode all about birding. Because this is something that I, I kind of entertain and jest for myself eventually. So that's why I was like, okay, I, I, I could put aside that this is a brain episode uh, for, for all that sweet, sweet bird action. Well, first of all, I would I would argue that they do patch uh, the great outdoors every once in a while. But, uh, you know, to make way for lovely pipelines and parking lots <laughs> and uh, uh, large right. eateries what, what, and shopping centers. What are they going to buff the piping plover? It's 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 really <laughs> not doing well in the meta. We need a big b piping plover buff and perhaps a, a big pipeline nerf for ha when, when's that pipeline nerf coming <laughs> It's so the pipelines are so OP these days. I can't. I can't even. I can't even get into a. I can't even get into a forest lobby without this kind of thing happening. Uh, no, but that's that's very interesting. You. I mean, don't take this the wrong way. You look kind of like a bird watching guy. I see. I don't take that the wrong way at all. I'm flattered. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, you're getting ready for this to potentially be your thing. I I know what you're talking about because every once in a while I kind of gauge. My interest in subjects that I used to think were for old people, you know, I'd kind of, and then every once in a while I find myself being like, what if I did get a model train set mm, or, or something model, like that? Or model firing equipment. It's funny. Yeah. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Say what you want about old people. They sure do have a lot of kooky ideas, but some of those old people activities are super duper fun. Um, I, I, one of my, every time the pandemic has locked us down, um, I make like a really insane kind of uh, uh, knee jerk purchase, um, mm. and this time it was I, I might have talked about this on the pod before, but it was a bocce ball set. Yeah, and, that's right. Your monogram bocce ball yes, set. Yes, that's right. So bocce ball set update it has since arrived, and there's been a couple nice days, and we're allowed to hang out in groups of ten outside now. So we've been putting it to use. And let me tell you something: those old Italian people that invented bocce ball. They knew what they were doing because that stuff is very fun. You could do that all day long. I had a bit of a bocce phase in high school, so yeah, I haven't played in such a long time. But I'm confident I could kill you in oh, bocce. Oh, definitely, definitely. The fact that you've already had a bocce phase. Listen, I have all summer to practice. Uh, maybe eventually I'll be able to get to your level. But yeah, I'm sure you'd be able to dominate me uh, at at the game of bocce. 
So not only are you, com- you know, committing to one day being an old man with bird watching, you're committing to being an old Italian man with mm-hmm. uh, your monogrammed bocce ball set. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually quite jealous. It's a pretty good like, and it's a good thing. Again, like one of the older instincts is just like, oh, it's a, it's a good reason to play outside. It's a good reason to go out in the great outdoors. <laughs> you know, from the ages of twenty to twenty nine, and even before that, I'd just be like, you know, f the great outdoors. I want to play video games. And I was just like. <laughs> I don't know. My 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 skin can only be so pasty for so long. I need to get that vitamin D <laughs> now that it's around. Um, yeah, I don't think I've found my old man interest just yet, but I know it's around. It's around the corner, and once I kind of find it, you know, whether it be coin collecting mm. or I don't know, like gardening. You know what? Actually, cooking is sort of becoming one of those things. I know. I'm I've, I've been following the updates on Insta. The the food updates. There you go. Yeah, so I've been getting, uh, I got a trial of Chef's Plate recently, which is kind of like, you know, one of those services that sends you a bunch of meals. I'm not very much use in the kitchen, but I am getting better, and I am learning to actually enjoy it. So maybe that'll be my thing as I get older. But who knows? Uh, it's nice to be able to have the, the luxury to uh, to grow older. So For the Birds is the name of this one. Brain's looking for something rare in nature, and he wonders of his friends what's the rarest thing that they have ever seen. For example, Buster says that he has this uh, donut with no hole, but it turns out it's actually a roll from a restaurant he went to, and then he eats it. It's several months or even years old, but apparently the butter is still good. Um, I think is it is it Binky who talks about Slip Bumfield from the Greebs? Yes. So uh, Buster brings up a donut with no hole, uh, and then Binky brings up Slip Bumfield, who is we're bringing this segment back. This might be our first one of season twelve. The throwaway character of the week, which <laughs> Slip Bumfield is uh, living up to his namesake, is a bum, and he can't get a single hit. He's some sort of old timey like it, it, it's it's very funny because they made him like an old man with like a very old timey style mustache which is like the mm. type of character i picture when i think of like abner doubleday or like the people that invented baseball baseball is one of those things where it's like so old there's all this like old timey stuff around baseball um and so slip bumfield is very much of that ilk uh and i got a big old kick out of seeing slip uh it's it's like a silent movie gag that's a <laughs> We also have Muffy, who is upset that her steak au pauvre at the Chateau Marmoset is not rare, which is what mm. she asked for. Mm. Which, how do, how do you think your steak will? Oh, well, say what you like. Say what you like about Muffy. Uh, she's got the right taste in steaks. I like a good rare, medium mm. rare at most. Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll go medium rare. I'm a little bit less adventurous, um, but I'm happy to hear you're of the il- rare ilk. I was, I was scared you'd be one of these well done people, so um, that's good to know. No, certainly not. I'm a rare breed. Uh, So eventually Brain is off to look for whatever this thing is, and he insists the camera person to not follow him. So the actual episode starts off with Brain uh, just having the radio on. Like, imagine. I guess it'd be like having Spotify on or something like that for all you youngsters. But a local radio show reports that the extinct green-tailed grebe may have been spotted around Elwood City. So we've seen the green-tailed grebe before in the Elwood City Turns 100 episode when Fern did that song-slash-interpretive dance about the fact that it went extinct. Oh, yeah! I for- I knew we had heard the term green-tailed grebe before. I mean, if not just because that's what the baseball team is called. Uh, but I had forgotten that we actually have seen like people talk about the bird itself. So apparently the Grebe is not the extinct one, but the green-tailed variant is the one that is extinct. So Brain's really excited. In fact, he is – so I guess this kind of reveals that Brain has a bit of an interest in bird watching, and he imagines himself – uh, receiving, as he says, his third Nobel Prize <laughs> for contributions to ornithology. And this isn't as, like, a man. This is, like, him receiving it as a boy. So he's expecting two more Nobel Prizes within very quick succession. So Brain gets set out to do this as he goes into the wild, like, the forest around Elwood City. He encounters Mr. Ratburn, who we have seen before, I believe, has shown an interest in bird watching, but Brain decides to kind of hold back and not tell Mr. Ratburn about the green-tailed grebe because then he fears that Mr. Ratburn will be the one to get the Nobel Prize. And we keep going back to this recurring joke of Brain at the uh, the ceremony, 
to receive the Nobel Prize. And he imagines this time that Mr. Ratburn is there and Brain's in the audience. And Ratburn's about to, like, acknowledge the work of his student, Alan Powers. But then he just goes, since they can't cut the award in half, I'll keep it myself. (laughs) A little bit of Solomon's wisdom from Mr. Ratburn. Mr. Ratburn really do be having the most hobbies, eh? He's, He's a puppeteer. He also makes his own puppets. Uh, he's a big fan of that fake Scooby-Doo show. Um, mm-hmm. And now we learn he is a bird watcher. He's an avid birder. Um, I guess it's at this point um, in the show, Mr. Rapper is single. So, yep. you know, as any single middle-aged man would do, it gives you a lot of time for hobbies. Um, and he doesn't know how a computer works, so he's got to fill his time with something. But he's a real catch. By the time he starts dating Patrick, I mean, I'm sure that that was a that was a real get. He's an interesting guy. Yeah, uh, he seems to be a real uh, extrovert in terms of all the ways he involves himself. So, if you yeah, if you pay attention to the details of Ratburn's character, he's an interesting guy. Uh, just like Lucas and I, he's got some interesting off the beaten path old man interests, but he's not that old. So. He's just an old soul, perhaps. After, so after Ratburn encounters Brain, he starts a bird watching club at the at uh, Lakewood Elementary, uh, which Arthur and Buster uh, do sign up for. Binky is a little bit more surly about it. He says, uh, "You know, it's just like who would want to go bird watching?" And then Arthur's like, "Well, don't you hunt for butterflies in the forest?" And Binky says, "It's okay to like butterflies because they're bugs." So, at some point, someone talks about, like, you don't want to go in the forest. There's snakes and bugs and wild animals in those woods. And then Pinky goes, there are? I'm there. Yeah, exactly. That's what uh, Brain tries to do to ward Binky away. Because what ends up happening is that the bird watching group gets so many uh, people to sign up. Uh, partially because uh, the reason Buster signs up is because he's talking about Skunkamunka which is a giant orange ape man, allegedly around the Elwood City limits, who has uh, apparently a terrible odor. So it's like the Elwood City version of Sasquatch. There's only been like one video recording of Skunkamunka, allegedly, which, uh, and Buster says that Skunkamunka might be the missing link, to which Brain responds, yeah, the missing link between a bad show and people who will believe anything. (laughs) Um, but yeah, Buster signs up, everybody signs up, including Binky and brain worries then that the Nobel prize will go to people like Buster and Arthur, who he clearly doesn't regard as being on his intellectual level. I also, I also liked here when they go on their initial kind of bird watching expedition, you might be able to hear birds in the background as my windows open, uh, try and guess which one you may be surprised. Um, we see that Muffy is still into digital cameras. It's it's again, we we're not quite at the stage yet where all the kids have smartphones and are taking pictures mm-hmm, with their mm-hmm. smartphones. You have to own a camera, and we've made mention of digital cameras before, but it's still very funny to see it. I know. Whenever I think of digital cameras, I, I first think of like Edge and Christians, like old like pose down when they would like pause for flash photography and then you would see all the people in the crowd take pictures with their digital cameras. It's funny though, some of these older digital cameras are coming back in a way like, uh, I mean, everybody knows that like film cameras are are coming back. Everybody takes pictures on like, oh, I got these 35 millimeter, like there's, there's just something about film cameras that people have kind of stuck with as like a hobby to this day. But some people are even going back to those old like Sony digital cameras because of the kind of mm. aesthetic of the weird kind of low quality pictures some of those cameras take. Um, and so even some of those cameras are now coming back into, into vogue with people buying them off eBay and stuff like that. So who knows? if maybe um, this camera that Muffy has would be sought after today. Um, She's bragging about how it has 6,000 megapixels, and I was trying to Google whether that would be, like, a ludicrous amount of megapixels, like, either, like, that is more megapixels than a camera could ever have, or, like, if you were to look at that today, and would that be, like, oh, 6,000 megapixels, that's, like, so not good, like, that's just, like, an old standard. But I was having trouble, like, actually looking this up. Like, I was trying to Google how many megapixels an iPhone 12 camera has, but I was having difficulty... Because it says it has like twelve, I, I and I might be reading these, uh, like the the specs wrong, but that seems mm. extra low. Unless that is the joke that it's like, oh, for a camera to have, it's like it's saying a razor has like twenty two blades or something. <laughs> I wouldn't know, unfortunately, but maybe one of our listeners does. 
Um, there is another funny moment that I liked. So, but uh, Brain gets paired off with um, Buster and Arthur, and they're kind of like, I would say, probably doing a more amateurish approach to bird watching. Not that I know much about bird watching itself, but. Uh, Arthur sees like a bird he sees a bird in the distance and is like whoa is that a woodpecker and Brain says is it pecking at the wood yeah then it's a woodpecker it's just Brain's really grumpy about having everybody around where the green tailed grebe might be because he doesn't want to share the credit but it's just really funny to see him be really catty about it um so eventually, like eventually, Brain like sees evidence, potential evidence of the green-tailed grebe, and eventually has to admit to Buster and Arthur. Like they catch him, they eventually kind of corner him a little bit, and he's like, "Okay, so the green-tailed grebe exists and might be here, but you can't tell anybody." And of course, as we know, Buster famously uh, not able to keep a secret. But this I found to be almost a little bit worse than normal. Uh, the next day at school, Buster is telling absolutely anyone who will listen that the green-tailed grebe is in the forest that they were... It was in the park that they were exploring, and Brain is super mad. And it's just like, yeah, Buster just broke a promise to Brain that he made to his face. And also, he doesn't apologize. Buster w- thought he was trying to help, but he doesn't say, I'm sorry at any point. He he printed off pamphlets and also That's made, right. like, a poster. And there's, like, if you, I have it paused right now. If you look at the poster, it says, the green-tailed grebe, and there's, like, arrows pointing to its uh, titular green tail. Uh, th- th- he could not be more flagrant with his uh, promise breaking. Uh, though I do like the, the excuse he gives, because um, Brain sort of challenges him on, you know, he said his lips were sealed. Uh, and then Buster says, they were, but then they were unsealed. I think it was around breakfast. Hmm. Implying that by eating his lips became unstuck. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. It's one of those things where it's like, yes, we know that Buster is bad at keeping a secret, but also like he shouldn't have, shouldn't have lied to brain's face or just like said nothing about that. It's just like, at some point you have to own the fact that you're bad at keeping secrets. Anyway, brain's really upset about this as I feel he should be. Um, even though it's not for a tremendously great reason. The next time at the forest, the bird watching club has like it basically doubled in membership. There's so many people there, and Buster takes a plan into his own hands. Uh, he dresses as a version of Skunkamunka. He basically puts like an orange rug over himself <laughs> yeah, it's like and an creates hood, these like yeah. yeah, and creates these like big footprints. And eventually, he scares off everyone who thinks that he is Skunkamunka. Um, and he steals. Muffy's lunch. Muffy, like, directs Binky and Arthur to carry around her picnic basket and a whole watermelon. And then once they run away, Buster just helps himself. Um, And we're not really exactly sure why, but it turns out that Buster did a little bit of research on his own. We find this out a little bit later uh, when he comes to Brain to apologize. And he says that he did a bit of research on his own and that the... um, that the green-tailed Gree, basically what he did by being Skunkamunka was clear out everybody from searching around for it so that Brain could go by himself. Uh, Brain eventually takes Buster along, and they do find the green-tailed Gree. It, it's, it's, we do get to see it. It kind of looks a little bit like a duck, almost. Well, like, it's, it's, it's a little bit portly. Um, and, and this is, like, I do kind of like... This this ending, I, I like the way this episode kind of uh, comes together because they they see the green tail gree, but before uh, Brain can get like a really good picture of it, they try to like play its call in order to draw it in closer. Um, but instead, because if you remember at the start of the episode, Brain accidentally had recorded before he could re- record the Grebe's call, he recorded the uh, the ad for Chicken Lickin. Um, which continues right. to show up, by the way. This is again one of those things where yeah, they're getting good. They're getting good use out of that. It, well, it's funny because Chicken Lickin isn't really usually the the things that they really keep to in continuity are like first three seasons stuff. I feel like Chicken Lickin was a much later development, but they yeah they keep bringing Chicken Lickin up. It's become kind of the the big Kahuna Burger rather of the Elwood yeah. City universe. It's as like the go to fast food place whenever they need to kind of do a fast food joke. Um, and so that kind of scares the Grebe off, um, and then we get this, this kind of, uh, melancholy, uh, ending where the, the real friends, the real green tail Grebe was the friends we made along the way, 
as uh, <laughs> Buster and Brain kind of walk into the subset and we see the Green Tail Grebe kind of standing watching them walk off. They've come to a bit more of an understanding. Um, it was just interesting. I never thought that we would actually see a real Green Tail Grebe, a little bit different from the outfit that Fern had, it made it out to be a little bit more closer to like a raven, but it is kind of, like I said, a little bottom heavy, mm. sort of like a duck. And that's where that story ends. Um, sometimes we find our episodes in a little bit of a different way than we normally do, and sometimes that can include postcards from you. That's right. So po- postcards, postcards from, from you. you. Uh, so this time, yeah. Oh, uh, just Go the, ahead. the question continues, and this is the same thing I've wondered. I think every time we've watched a part of postcards from you, is is how is this getting filmed? Like, what is the nature of postcards from you? Is it legitimately footage that kids are sending in, um, and then it's being re-edited by a professional television editing team, or is like is it pretend footage like this? That, it, like, they're actually sending a camera crew, but they're shooting it like it's made by the kids and then editing it. Uh, and that still kind of remains to be seen. I think I lean towards the uh, the former rather than the latter, uh, but it's still kind of fascinating to think about. Yeah, I know that this is something that is consistently interesting to you. And if we ever talk to somebody on the production side of Arthur, I will make sure to uh, to, to, to find out more about this. But, um, yeah, our first one is from Pascal in New York City. Uh, She's talking about going to one of the natural places in the city, which is Central Park, and how it's important that everybody picks up litter. Now, unlike a lot of kids that we see, especially on Postcards from You, it sounds like you agree with me on this. Pascal's a natural. She's really good in front of the camera. Pascal really made me laugh. She's got this line about... um, uh, you know, you've probably heard two things about New York. It's got a dense population, a lot of people live there, and there's a lot of litter. Well, the first one, you're right, and the second one is kind of right. Like, I thought she was going to say, like, <laughs> there isn't any litter, but then she, she still admits, like, oh, no, there's litter, but... But it's good, but it's good to, uh... To watch out, to watch out for it, and uh, yeah, it's 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 always good when a, one of these kids is kind of able to inject a little bit of a uh, little bit of rocket fuel into this. And our second one, again, kind of more along what we've come to expect from postcards from you. It's Carly and her friends in Sabasco, Maine, who are traveling on the river in like a motorboat, and they happen upon apparently one of Carly's adult friends pulling lobster traps. What I loved about this was that the audio quality was so terrible <laughs> they're, because they're, they're both on, it's like they come across basically like a lobster boat and they're on another motor boat and the motors are going so loudly and that you can barely tell what the lobster fisher, uh, fisher person, the lobster fisher or uh, Carly are saying at any time. And they have to use these like on screen graphics to be like, it's like, it, you know, it's like imagine that is going at all times and just like, yeah, I got it. So I'm, uh, it, was, it was this big, then I throw it back, but if I then, now, then I keep it. it I, I don't know. I just got a real kick out of that. And then at the very end of it, we see like Carly talking about how like lobsters are also best when they're eaten. And she's got this wacky lobster hat on. I love this lobster hat. It's true. It, 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 it's really drippy. And I wish, you know, we come from lobster country. Will. Oh uh, yeah. I, I wish I had a lobster hat and bib combo like this. Uh, next time I eat a lobster roll, it's, it's lobster roll season. So, well, uh, that is a very animal heavy first half of the episode and we will talk about the second half uh when we come back in just a moment hey everybody it's lucas from the elwood city limits podcast and if you love ecl there's a couple of ways to keep up with us you could go to facebook.com slash elwood city limits at ecl podcast that's our twitter we take questions on tumblr it's elwoodcitylimits.tumblr.com. There is an Instagram as well, Elwood City Limits on Instagram. Of course, if you want to donate to the show and get exclusive content, whether that's our full-length commentary of the Arthur movies, our brand new 
new uh, bi-weekly PBS Kids review show, as well as our video game movie reviews with the Sonic movie review and Pikachu movie review. You can check out patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. Uh, and that's also going to get you access to the Elwood City Limits Discord, which me and Will like to post in from time to time. And if you want that sweet, sweet Elwood City Limits merch, check out teespring.com slash stores slash Elwood hyphen city hyphen limits hyphen store. You can listen to the podcast at libsyn.com slash Elwood City Limits, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and there's other podcast apps like Stitcher. And if we're not on your favorite app, let us know. And where can you let us know? Well, that's going to be at ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com. That's also where you can send us a question and we'll read it on the show. Finally, if you want to support the podcast, the best way to do so is to tell a friend who likes animation or Arthur or just podcasts in general and to go to our iTunes page and rate us out of five stars. Apparently, that helps podcasts out. Bye, everybody. We were lucky enough to hear your cat in the background. If anybody is interested, one of the perks of being a, an Elwood City Limits patron is that once in a while, Lucas will drop a cat picture <laughs> uh, on the Discord. We were very happy to receive that. That's right. She's very photogenic. <laughs> uh, so our second part of the episode is called Ungifted. And it starts off by Arthur telling us a fairy tale. And it appears to be going the way of Jack and the Beanstalk, because what happens in this fairy tale, first of all, Arthur and Buster are in medieval times living what appears to be their cottage core dreams. They both own a farm and they're both dressed in like very patchy um, kind of quaint clothing. Like this looked like uh, one of the TikToks I run across every now and then. <laughs> it's very cottage core. I, uh, uh, yeah, I always found as a kid the story of Jack and the Bing's Beanstalk to be particularly morbid. Um, like, oh, yeah? I feel like even in the like storybook, like picture book versions, like the giant always gets murdered. There's a lot of talk of like uh, cannibalism yeah, or murder, and I remember being a child finding that the the ba- Jack of the Beanstalk story was particularly violent compared to other uh, uh, kind of childhood stories. Well, we don't quite get there. This one's actually ends up being a bit more realistic. So Arthur goes into town, and he's bringing their beloved cow with him, and he ends up selling the cow f- to the brain for a bag of gold. And then on the way back home, he sells that bag of gold to Muffy for a goose that lays golden eggs. He's really upselling. Yeah, really. But then then he busts because he he trades the goose to Binky, who gives him, quote unquote, magic beans that Arthur puts in the ground. Buster obviously very upset with this. And they don't end up growing a giant beanstalk. They just end up uh, growing a plant that grows beans. And Buster doesn't even like beans. (laughs) <laughs> so this is a bit of a theme going forward. M- like the first thing right off the bat as we start, um, Buster's mom has to go out and get and she needs an umbrella. And Buster says, why don't you take my hat? And we see Buster has an honest to God tinfoil hat. <laughs> That's right. I think he even calls it tinfoil hat by name. Why don't you wear my foil hat? That's right. And I mean, I mean, uh, this is kind of. I, I listened to your appearance on uh, Podcast 69 recently. You were very, <laughs> as we always like to do, we always talk about how Buster is the most conspiratorial member of the Arthur crew. And it's like, sometimes it's like, ha ha ha, that's cute. But then it's like, oh, this is a bit more troubling. Oh, that he has uh, this. It's true. It's like, what would Buster be saying about the coronavirus vaccine, for instance? Would he be worried Ugh. that it was magnetic? And he'd be trying to say that, like, oh, look, look at me. Hold up the safety pin to my arm. It's going to stick. <laughs> Oh, but nothing is better than seeing those people not be able to prove what they're talking about. <laughs> I just watched that today. That's so great. That woman trying to put up the bobby pin to her neck and it's just not sticking. It's the best. Uh, so that, that that immediately I was like, oh, boy. So Buster goes to find her an umbrella and looking around in the closet, he finds a model kit of a like a, a toy sized wheat thresher called the Grain Reaper. <laughs> which is which... such a funny name. Like, yeah. I, I can't imagine, usually the, these model kits, especially one of like farming equipment, the whole point of the model is to be like super to scale accurate to the real life machine. Um, so it makes me wonder like in the Arthur universe, is the farming equipment 
uh, called the Grain Reaper. Like, is that the kitschy kind of name that they try to market this thing to farmers with? Uh, it's funny, speaking of my podcast appearances, we talk about how on um, the the episode of Samurai Pizza Cats that just came out uh, today, a couple of days ago, if you're listening to this on Friday when this episode comes out, um, the episode of Samurai Pizza Cats I was on, uh, we talked about how I've been blocking every ad that comes up on my Twitter news feed. Right. So that I only get really weird esoteric ads now instead of like the advertisers that are usually trying to advertise to me, uh, mm-hmm. such as French farming equipment seems to be French Canadian farming equipment really? to be specific. Um, and I, I haven't been blocking those ads because I find them really funny. But now Twitter <laughs> thinks that I am a uh, farmer in rural Quebec and it has lots of equipment it wants to sell me. So I'll keep an eye out for some sort of grain reaper. Every or, or in this case, uh, Le Grand Reaper or something. <laughs> Every once in a while, I do get, like, French content, and I'm like, I I can't explain to you how much this doesn't apply to me. Like, I'll get a a TikTok in French, and I'm like, great, I wish I knew what they were saying. Oh, see, I I, I like the TikToks in French, because it's like, the level of extraction, abstraction, makes the joke mm. funnier to me. Like, that one video of the, there's a French TikTok I really like, where it's this guy watching someone make, like, a really artisanal poutine, where, you know, he's not using, uh, uh, he's, he's making it with all these, like, really high highfalutin ingredients instead of making, like, your classic poutine. Um, and I can't quite understand what the French guy is saying, but he's getting very upset about this poutine tutorial until the part where he's like, no bechamel, no bechamel, and he's, like, <laughs> screaming, and he's like, oh, no! And the fact that I can't understand him only serves to make it funnier. What's usually funny is that so my wife is completely bilingual. She speaks English and French, but I will show her a TikTok from somebody in Quebec, and she'll be like, I have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's also a, there's also a great one I found of they tried to teach the, uh, the text-to-speech voice how to uh, talk in Quebecois, but she's like, how to speak, how to swear in in Quebecois. <laughs> anyway, um, a lot of French content. Maybe maybe these ads are getting ready for your old man interest to be not bird watching, but farming. Mm, true, maybe, true. Maybe, maybe they know something you don't. So they think that this is from Buster's uncle, who just never got around to building it. So Buster ends up building it himself and gives it to Arthur. This reminded me of back in when I was in grade seven, one of my end of year final projects was to to build a model airplane like a model world war ii airplane it is it was not easy like it was it was like and it was like like fully one of those like not with snapping parts you had to like glue it Mm. and sand down the parts and stuff like that it was it was tough it reminds me of my my roommate is a big uh, gundam guy so He's oh been, yeah, he's been working on these like gunpla model kits uh, for a while, and they're fairly involved. Like he's got to put in some hours, uh, and it's, it's a multi-day thing. It's not like Lego where you could finish it all in one session. Um, so that reminded me of that. And of course, when Arthur, one of the most famous Arthur episodes of all time, Arthur builds a model plane, um, which DW smashes. Then he punches her in the face. I, 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 not in the face. He punches her in the shoulder. He punches her in the shoulder. See, I that, always, that... I always conflate it with the episode where the Tibbles smash DW in the face right. with the uh, the swing, and she needs stitches. I always get those those two episodes crossed in my head. That that was that was my listening to podcast sixty nine. That was my like yelling at my phone. I was oh. just like, he, he didn't punch her in the face. It was the shoulder. But I was just like, don't. It's okay. Like it's okay. The point it was the point is he punched her and it's fine. It's really fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, it just kind of brought me back to that. To I, I would I would love to build model Gundams, but like I would want to start with the ones that are like that have the snap on pieces that are a little bit easier. I like I like I want to build more Lego sets is what I want to do. Sorry, Buster builds this. He says it takes him about an hour, and then he gives it to Arthur as a kind of a couple of months early birthday present. Uh, Bus- uh, Arthur is really adamant in getting down to the theater because the first 20 kids will get uh, signed Dark Bunny posters. Now, I missed the movie that Dark Bunny... I missed the title of the movie that Dark Bunny is uh, a part of. It's like him versus a giant octopus, essentially. It's true. I missed the title of the movie, too, because uh, when Arthur goes to collect his poster and he's at the movie theater, 
my eyes were drawn to the other movies that are showing at the time. Uh, oh, I, I missed and, this. Oh, and I'm happy to report that the number one movie in Elwood City is still in theaters. 5,000 Explosions and a Supernova yes. is still being showed at the Elwood City Cineplex, uh, as well as, what does that say? Quest for Mammoth Okay, is the, is the other film. Maybe it's like, do you remember that movie... 20,000 BC or whatever that movie was yeah, called. Yeah, 10,000 BC 10, or whatever BC, it was. 10,000 uh, BC uh, or, or Apocalypto. It could be something like that. But more sure. importantly, more importantly, um, the number one Elwood City movie of all time, 5,000 Explosions at the Supernova, is still raking up record numbers in the box office. It's like uh, my Big Fat Greek Wedding where it never left theaters because people just kept going to see it. Yeah, we're, in, we're into like several – I mean, well, I mean – uh, I guess we might not be into several years, but several years of our real lifetime, this this movie has been around. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm glad to see that it is still still it has that Titanic grip on mm-hmm. the number one spot. Mm-hmm. Great. I imagine when, when you, you know, 5001 Explosions at a Supernova comes out, it's going to be a huge, it's going to be the box office event of the season. Yeah, but they gotta ride. They gotta ride out that first wave for all it's worth before, and then they can maybe release, re-release it or something. Mm, the Criterion. Um, <laughs> that's what I want. Criterion release. Five thousand explosions of supernova. Please, I would love it. Um, I mean, Koinos is in the in yeah. the in the Criterion collection. It's not that far off. Um, so uh, Arthur gets this Grain Reaper Thresher. And goes back to the theater, and Binky, unfortunately, has gotten the last signed Dark Bunny poster. But he offers to trade his signed poster for what Binky calls the Thrasher. And as this thing keeps getting traded, people keep using different names for it. It's kind of like a game of telephone. So Binky calls it the Thrasher because, hey, there's a wrestler named the Thrasher. And Binky's close. There was a wrestler in the Attitude Era called Thrasher. So that's not that far off. Mm. Thrasher of the Headbangers. Arthur does give it away, and he excitedly tells goes to tell Buster about his poster, but upon telling Buster that he traded the Thrasher for it, Buster is very upset because it was a gift that he gave to Arthur. It's like, you know how many hours I worked on that? Arthur says, well, you told me you only worked on it for one. He's like, yeah, but I still worked hard on it. So Buster is very upset. And this, the rest of the episode is about Arthur trying to figure out how exactly to make it up to Buster. So his original plan is to give Buster a homemade card, which, again, going back to the cottage core thing, it's just like he's asking to be let out of the doghouse, which I found to be yeah, funny was, wording for two best really friends. That was really funny. And if you, like, look at the card, it's like a picture of Pal crying. And yeah. It says, sorry. But, it, yeah, it's, it's very funny to, like, talk about a settling an argument with your friend as being let out of the doghouse. Yeah. And I really liked DW clowning on this idea of Arthur giving a card, of just DW being like, you broke his model and you're giving him a card? Which she's wrong about him breaking it, but it is still funny that you're just like, you're giving him a card to say you're sorry? And then Arthur wants to give him a gift and and almost gives him a pair of mittens that Grandma Thora gave him. And then he's afraid it will start this feedback loop where Grandma Thora will be upset that Arthur gave away these like these hand knitted mittens that she slaved over. <laughs> We've gone from uh, Buster working an hour on the the Thresher model to uh, in this uh, imagination sequence, Grandma Thora talks about literally years. That went right. into uh, knitting these mittens. It reminded me of the uh, the sweater curse. Have you ever looked up the sweater curse about how like I don't, I don't uh, pe- so. people who are in the knitting community have this idea of like you should never give a partner uh, a, a hand knit sweater uh, until oh, yeah? you marry them because if you give them the sweater, they're going to break up with you. Um, oh, and, and there's all sorts of like non uh, kind of magic reasons for this, like sociological reasons, whether it be, you know, the person doesn't recognize how much work goes into that gift. And so they don't respond to it as nice as they want to. Or perhaps the person kind of resents that the person's into knitting. There's all these different reasons why uh, this the sweater would precede a breakup. Uh, but it is a very real thing in the knitting community. So that's what they got. The, the, Arthur re-gifting these mittens and uh, uh, Grandma Thor being so distraught reminded me of. This is complete use, news to me, but I am not someone who – I am not likely going to be someone who is going to knit. Okay. So, uh, so that, that's, that, uh, that's that not, won't be your old man hobby. We're still looking it, for it. Prob- probably not. 
Um, eventually, DW suggests to just give Buster the signed poster, which, by the way, is signed to Binky. So, uh, which which I think would be funny as time goes on. Like if you kept that and just like, ah, I remember that. It's a good story. But you know, Arthur's like, just like, should I do it? And DW says it's a picture of a bunny dancing with an octopus. How it could be more important than your best friend. So Arthur decides to do that, gives him the card and the poster, but Buster rejects the gift. He is not really won over by this. He's really upset. And he's also very worried that when his uncle Stu comes to visit later, uh, he won't be able to show him the thresher, and he's worried that he'll be disappointed. In fact, we have this we have this sequence where Arthur has a dream that he goes over to Buster's place while his uncle Stu is there, and his uncle is like locked up in the bathroom and like <laughs> sobbing because Having apparently sort of that meltdown, yeah, <laughs> because apparently that thresher. I forget what he, uh, he calls it Darlene. He says that Darlene is like, it's not just a thresher. It's my best friend. And then Arthur's just like, I'm I'm sorry I gave it away, sir. And he's like, you, you're the one who traded away Darlene. It's just like such like Arthur. Like, it's funny that it wasn't just an imagination he had. It's like a dream because I have no problem believing that Arthur jumps to this ridiculous conclusion uh within within waking life well and, and then it, then we get into arthur kind of first three seasons territory where it really yeah. gets into a nightmare where he goes that's darlene's mama <laughs> and they get attacked by some manner of truckosaurus where there's like a red truckosaurus that descends upon the house and it it, it like attacks them and that's the end of arthur's dream it's quite harrowing um, I think there's a lot about them getting turned into grain or something. Like, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> they're going to get like, harvested. De- definitely the implication that they're going to be killed. <laughs> Much like Arthur as well, when he wakes up with a start from his dream, I am also sleeping shirtless these days because it is very, very warm. It was just odd for me to see Arthur without a shirt on. Mm. It made me think that maybe maybe this is in summer, maybe like the heat of summer. It's true. It's a, Is this our first look at Arthur's nips? Definitely not because we've seen him sim- swimming before, but it was – evocative of like remember when mario odyssey uh first released those screenshots of like yep. mario running around in those beach levels and you're like whoa mario's got nipples yeah and just everything that that implies yeah arthur at least has just like little pencil dots on his chest so it's not not much to look at uh eventually after like so arthur has to go basically to every person that ended up being traded the thresher for something like binky ended up selling the thresher to brain and then brain ended up donating it Mm. to the school because it was like a model Mm. of, you know, an important time of like farming equipment. And then it turns out that the school couldn't take it because it was missing a piece. It was like missing pieces. Uh, So they are going to sell it in the school's tag sale. And then at the tag sale, Arthur finds that Mrs. Tibble almost buys it and he convinces her to let him buy it back. But then the Tibbles steal it and do a complete football pass, but then Tommy just spikes it. So I I loved this whole sequence. I thought this was very, like, it was evocative of, like, an 80s movie or something. Like, an 80s movie plot of, like, okay, we're going to have this montage of him kind of retracing his steps, trying to make right what he's he's wrought, um, all the way to this kind of school, like, tag sale. Um, and then I found this sequence very harrowing, and it's intentionally kind of edited that way, where the Tibbles are throwing around the thresher, and you're like, oh my god, the Tibbles are going to break it. And then they successfully do a perfect spiral with the thresher, only to spike it once they've successfully done the pass. Uh, and I just thought this all really worked well, and it was funny. One of the few times that we actually see the Tibbles being scolded for doing something True. wrong. So she does do it. Uh, Mrs. Tibble, that is. Eventually, Arthur like scoops up the, all of the pieces and returns it, manages to return it to Buster, um, but not as the Thresher. He does it more as like a in, like a modern art sculpture almost. There, the parts of it still kind of work, like the track, the, the traction parts that would usually cause it to move, um, are still kind of working. But but Buster and his uncle appreciate that it's been kind of remade into this modern art thing. We actually end on something really sweet. I liked this. Where Buster and Arthur decide to go to a local toy store and buy a model that they can build together. So it's something fun that they can do together. Arthur initially thinks that they're going to build a rocket ship, but then Buster sees a different kind of farming equipment. (laughs) Like earlier in the episode, 
uh, you know, after Buster finishes the Thresher, Arthur's like, I didn't know you were into farming equipment. And Buster's like, I'm not, but I just really like the model. And now we see that Buster's own old man interest is yes. growing because he sees a completely different type of farming equipment and is like geeking out over it. How long until he installs Farming Simulator on his PC and spends like $1,000 on, on expansion packs? Sooner than you may think. I mean, uh, Farming Simulator, from what I've seen, is you know good for practically any age so might not be might not be too long so let's roll it back this was a, a lot a lot of old man interests uh purveying these episodes lucas what did you think of for the birds i really liked for the birds i i, okay. I think something about both of these episodes is there's a lot of funny jokes in them um and it's something that i think the start of season 12 has been light on is just I, you find when you write down in your notes the quotable lines right and, and both of these episodes are kind of chock full of them there's lots of parts in for the birds that made me laugh um brain interesting enough is is he's not really doing his typical annoying brain shtick there's not a lot of him correcting people in this episode uh they use him kind of uh the writers kind of acknowledge Brain's problems in this and that they're like, yeah, he's he's kind of being selfish here and he's really, really concerned that someone else is going to get the credit for this big discovery, right? He wants to have this Pulitzer Prize and we, we see in his imagination uh, other people getting the credit and that, that showing him, uh, that embarrassing him or, or him being really upset about that. But then in the actual episode, you know, we get a case of we're feeling for Brain because, like you pointed out earlier, Buster, like an idiot, kind of spreads uh, spreads the word about the Grebe all over the school. But I actually really like the way that it wraps up. I, I like that Buster kind of scared everybody, and he had the wherewithal to uh, uh, scare everyone away from the spot so it could just be him and Brain to look for the Grebe. And then it did my favorite, favorite ending. This is... My favorite thing, if any Arthur episode ends this way, it's always kind of my primary way I like them to end, where it doesn't exactly give you what you want. It has a little bit of melancholy to it, where they they see the Grebe and they have the satisfaction of seeing the Grebe, but he doesn't quite get the picture, so he doesn't get all the credit. Um, and then he realizes, you know, his friendship with Buster is more important than the Grebe itself. You know, it's about the journey, not the destination. So I really liked kind of the melancholy way it ends. Um, what about yourself? What did you think of it? I liked it a bit more than I thought I would. Um, you know, when you, it was it was a bit of a tough pitch from the from the <laughs> from the very outset. It was like the brain goes bird watching, and I'm like, geez, we are running out of ideas, aren't we? <laughs> but the way they the way they approached it, I thought was uh, was interesting enough. Um, they kind of added enough little things to it to make to kind of keep it keep it flowing pretty well. Um, I always I also think brain can be. Equal parts, like, sympathetic at times, but also, like, you don't mind seeing him taken down a peg or two. Like, especially when he was worried. Like, his biggest worry is that Arthur Buster and Mr. Ratburn will get the Nobel Prize before him. So you're just like, okay, well, nobody cares about that. But it also leads to him making decisions that kind of further the story a little bit. And honestly, like, I mentioned it before, but I, I'm surprised at how, like, not cool Buster was in terms of like just completely going back on his word. And I thought that that was, it wasn't out of character. It just kind of really like, like it was like a splash of cold water on the face. I was like, man, like that, that's kind of Buster's one of his worst ongoing traits, which again, true to his character, but still kind of stinks when you see it because he's such a, like a happy go lucky guy. It's just weird to think of him with any flaws, but I'm glad that they are there anyway. Yeah, no, I, I, I thought that this was, I thought that this was pretty good. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't love it or anything, but I did, uh, I, I liked it fine. And I would probably say similar for ungifted. In fact, I'd say I liked Ungifted a bit more than um, For the Birds, simply because there really is, I, th I think, where it ended up. I appreciated that at the end, the message is about, like, the, it's it's all about Buster doing something nice for Arthur, and then the consequences of, like, not taking that seriously. And I think it's, you can look at it as an episode with a message without being so in your face about it, as Arthur or other shows can be. It's just, like, you need to have a proper respect and gratitude for when your friend goes out of their way to do something nice for you. And I think that that's something that a lot of us still continue to learn as we grow out of shows like Arthur and get older. 
And I did like how it ended up in the end of just like Buster just wants to do something fun with his friend. And it just, I don't know, it was very pure in a way that really touched me. And I like I and again the details end up making some of this episode. Like I just like that it was a uh, the idea of Buster making a wheat thresher, mo- a model of a wheat thresher of all things. Like it could have been like a World War II plane or something, and that would have been a bit more understandable than a wheat thresher. And then this whole like game of telephone over trading it. I don't know. There was just a there was a, there was quite a bit to like in this, and uh, yeah, I, I like I liked it pretty well. I agree. I think this episode is another case where very quotable. I think I was laughing throughout this episode. I agree that the little details are really fun. The fact that it was a wheat thresher and, you know, we get a new character with Buster's Uncle Stu. And I, I, I also really liked that we have a return to kind of the the extra morbid Arthur dream sequence where they all get eaten by some sort of Transformers-like uh, truckosaurus creature. That was really fun. And similar to the first episode, I think the strong strongest point of this episode is the ending. I really like the way it wraps up how, again, it wasn't really about the Wheat Thresher all along. It was about their friendship. It's, it's. I understand why they kind of paired these two episodes together because they're similar themes. Um, and I think this last sequence is really the shining point of the episode. It, it might be my favorite part of the episode. Like I said before, this very like 80s movie sequence of Arthur trying to retrace his steps and get the Thresher back, and you can see the effort Arthur's putting in, and then it's quite dramatic when the, the Tibble Twins are like throwing it around. I was invested at this point, and I was like, oh god, don't don't smash the Thresher. Um, so yeah, I, I like the episode as well. Well, good. I know that last week we were, I, I think me especially, was a little bit more... Um negative on the Arthur on the Arthur episode we watched there. So I'm glad that we kind of were able to bring it back up again. I was pretty confident they would be able to. Uh, the season 12, uh, still a bit too early to say, but has had some definite highlights so far. Well, that's the end of another episode of Elwood City Limits. Thank you very much for joining us. Of course, next week it is going to be our Patreon week, and we are continuing our look at the PBS Kids Bookworm Bunch. And we are going to take a look at... The perhaps one of the less remembered parts of the Bookworm Bunch, and that's the Corduroy Animated Series. I'm going to the library tomorrow. I put in a a hold for the uh, original Corduroy book, so I'm going to read it for the first time in what has to be more than 20, 25 years. And then we're going to take a look at the cartoon show and a little bit about its history and the history of the story and everything like that. I feel like everybody at least at a certain age, has read Corduroy at one time or another. And then next time on Elwood City Limits in two weeks, we will be back with uh, another Arthur episode in Season 12. We're looking at the Chronicles of Buster and on this spot. What that exactly means, we'll just have to wait and find out. Well, Lucas, um, I, I, is, is Buster going to be, you know, the galaxy's greatest criminal and he has to break out of, of prison and and they're also going to make a, a PS2 game about it? I, I will have to see. A surprisingly well-received <laughs> video game about it. So, um, yeah, we're, we'll we'll uh, we'll look forward to doing that as we get into the world. Well, we haven't even started summer, but it feels like summer has been here for ages. Uh, As we await our next COVID vaccine, we certainly hope that you are staying healthy and safe wherever you are. Uh, Thanks to everybody who continues to reach out to us as always. Uh, Remember, if you leave us a review anywhere, be it on our Facebook page, on iTunes, or anywhere else you can give us a rating, uh, let us know, and we will give you a shout-out on the show. We really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, we just love hearing from you and hope that you're doing well. So, uh, for Elwood City Limits, my name's Will Young, and for Lucas Mancini... And then I said, that's no way to treat a poodle. We'll see you next time.